Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown, and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go. Let me give you some background first. I've been dealing with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and partial paralysis for a few years now. It's been tough, but I've learned to adapt and keep my independence as much as possible. On this particular day, I was feeling pretty good and decided to do my own shopping instead of relying on delivery services. I drove to the local supermarket, grateful for my handicap plate that allowed me to park in the designated spaces near the entrance. As I got out of my car, I noticed another person walking with a similar gait to mine. I didn't think much of it at first. We were both heading towards the store entrance and I saw him grab a shopping cart from the corral. I figured he was just another shopper going about his business. When we entered the store, something odd happened. The guy stopped at a wall covered in employee photos and kissed one of them. Yeah, you heard that, right? I was a bit weirded out, but I tried not to judge. Maybe it was a relative or something. I stepped around him and made my way to where the motorized scooters were kept. There was only one left, so I settled into it, relieved that I wouldn't have to struggle through the store on foot today. That's when all hell broke loose. The man who had been kissing the photo suddenly appeared next to me. He started yelling at me, asking what I thought I was doing and claiming that the scooter was for him. I tried to explain that I had no way of knowing that, especially since he already had a cart. He insisted that he always uses the scooter and that everyone knows that. I apologized but stood my ground telling him that I needed it too and that I had gotten there first. He stormed off towards the customer service desk, and I could hear him complaining loudly about me. I followed, worried that I might be forced to give up the scooter. The man was demanding that they make me give the scooter back, claiming that I had stolen it from him. The customer service representative looked annoyed and sighed heavily. They explained to the man that they had been through this before, and that the scooters were first come, first served. They told him that since I got it first, it was mine to use. The man protested, saying he always uses it and that I couldn't just take it. The representative told him that those were the rules and asked him to stop causing a scene. I was relieved that they sided with me, but my ordeal wasn't over. As I started my shopping, I realized the man was following me through the store and occasionally shouting insults. He called me a scooter thief and a fake disabled person saying I didn't even look sick. I tried my best to ignore him, but it was getting harder by the minute. Other shoppers were starting to stare, and I could feel my anxiety rising. I focused on getting my groceries as quickly as possible, hoping to escape this nightmare. When I finally made it to the checkout, I was exhausted and on the verge of tears. The cashier gave me a sympathetic look as she rang up my items. She apologized for what I had to deal with and mentioned that the man does this quite often. When I asked why he hadn't been banned from the store, she explained that his mother is one of the managers and always makes excuses for him. As she was telling me this, I noticed a man approaching the customer service desk again, this time with an older woman in tow. She looked like she was in charge, and I realized this must be his mother, the manager. I decided I'd had enough. I maneuvered my scooter over to them determined to stand up for myself. I addressed the situation, explaining to the manager how her son had been harassing me throughout my entire shopping trip simply because I used a scooter that he felt entitled to. I told her that this behavior was unacceptable. The manager looked flustered, clearly not used to being confronted about her son's actions. She tried to make excuses, mentioning that her son has special needs. I cut her off, explaining that having special needs doesn't excuse harassment. I told her about my own disabilities and how her son's behavior had made my shopping experience miserable. I pointed out that it wasn't fair to other customers. The man tried to interrupt, but I held up my hand to stop him. I told him that he had said enough for the day and that it was time for him to listen. I explained how his actions were selfish and hurtful and that he didn't own the scooter or get to decide who uses it. I suggested that he learn some empathy and respect for others. The manager's face turned red, torn between defending her son and acknowledging the truth of my words. 
Finally, she turned to him and told him that they had talked about this before and that he couldn't keep doing this. She suggested finding him a different activity during the day instead of coming to the store. The man looked shocked, clearly not expecting his mother to side against him. He took off, leaving his card behind. The manager turned back to me looking embarrassed. She apologized for her son's behavior and for not addressing this issue sooner. She offered me a discount on my groceries and assured me that they would be taking steps to ensure this doesn't happen again. I'm a single mom and my story begins when I decided to have a baby on my own. I was tired of waiting for the right person so I went to a sperm bank. Nine months later, my beautiful daughter was born. Everything was perfect until that day at the park. I was pushing my six-month-old in her stroller when this woman approached me. She had that look. You know, the one that screams, I'm about to make your life miserable. The woman cooed over my baby asking if she was mine. When I confirmed, she expressed doubt about my ability to be a mother due to my young appearance. I was taken aback. Who did she think she was? I assured her that I was perfectly capable of raising my daughter. She then shared her opinion that children need both parents, implying I was selfish for depriving my child of that. I tried to walk away, but she followed me. She went on to tell me about her and her husband's struggles to conceive, suggesting they could provide a loving home with two parents for my baby. Shocked, I told her this was my child and asked her to leave us alone. I hurried home shaken by the encounter. A few days later, I noticed a car parked across the street from my house. It was there for hours. The next day, it was back. I started to feel uneasy. Then came the phone calls. My number isn't listed, so I have no idea how she got it. The woman called, asking if I was the mother from the park. When I demanded to know how she got my number and told her to stop calling, she insisted she just wanted to talk and could offer my baby a better life. I hung up and blocked the number, but she kept calling from different numbers. I was scared and angry. I called the police, but they said they couldn't do much without proof of a direct threat. One afternoon, I was in the backyard with my daughter when I heard a noise from inside the house. I froze. Someone was trying to break in. I grabbed my baby and ran to the neighbor's house, calling 911 on the way. When the police arrived, they found her inside my house. She had pictures of my baby and me. She'd been stalking us for weeks. The woman tried to justify her actions, claiming she was trying to save the baby and give her a real family. The officers handcuffed her, but as they were leading her out, she broke free. She lunged at me, trying to grab my daughter. I didn't think, I just reacted. My fist connected with her face, and I heard a sickening crunch. Blood gushed from her nose as she fell back. She yelled that I had broken her nose and threatened to sue me. I shouted back that she had tried to kidnap my baby. The officers quickly restrained her again. As they put her in the police car, I held my daughter close, my hands shaking. The following weeks were a blur of police statements and court appearances. It turned out she had a history of harassing new mothers, believing she had a right to any baby she wanted. The judge didn't buy her, I just wanted to help act. In the end, she got five years for attempted kidnapping, breaking and entering, and stalking. I got a restraining order that would last long after her prison sentence. This woman had picked the wrong mother to mess with. I might be young, I might be single, but I was fierce. No one would ever threaten my family again. When I finally got my corgi three years ago, it was like a missing piece of my life fell into place. We bonded instantly, and I knew I wanted to give her the best life possible. That's how I stumbled into the world of dog sports. It started with basic obedience classes, then agility training, and now we're diving into scent work. My little corgi absolutely loves it. Her tail wags nonstop during our sessions. I found this great instructor through my man trailing club. She's experienced and really knows how to bring out the best in both dogs and handlers. When she announced a special two-hour workshop, I jumped at the chance. Even though it meant driving nearly an hour into the Welsh Valleys, I knew it would be worth it. Yesterday was the day of the workshop. I packed up the car, made sure my corgi was comfortable in her crate, and set off early to avoid traffic. 
We arrived at this tiny community center nestled in the countryside. The car park was small, with space for maybe seven cars at most. There were only four of us attending the workshop, so we had plenty of room. The first hour flew by. My corgi was in her element, sniffing out hidden treats and toys with enthusiasm. That's when we heard a commotion outside. Our instructor went to check and came back looking annoyed. She informed us that a football match was starting on the pitch across the way and the players had filled up the entire car park. We weren't too worried at first. Surely they'd realize their mistake and move, right? Wrong. The workshop finished and one of the other attendees went to speak with them. She politely explained that our cars were blocked in and asked if they could move. The team manager shouted out to his players, asking if anyone was parked at the community center and needed to move their cars. Not a single person budged. They just kept on playing like we didn't exist. 20 minutes later, we tried again. I approached them and explained that we really needed to get going, mentioning that our dogs had been waiting patiently but needed to get home. One of the spectators, who I'll call Karen, dismissed our concerns. She casually told us not to worry and said they'd move at half time. Half time came and went. Still no movement. By this point, we were all getting frustrated. It had been over two hours since our workshop ended, and we were effectively trapped. Finally, at 4.15 p.m., they started trickling back to their cars. There were no apologies or acknowledgement to the inconvenience they'd caused. They just gave us entitled attitudes and dirty looks when we asked them to hurry up. As we were finally able to leave, the community center caretaker wandered over. He shared some interesting information with us. Apparently, these football players weren't even supposed to park there during matches. The caretaker mentioned that they do this all the time and don't care about anyone else. I was fuming. These selfish people had wasted hours of our time, potentially stressed out our dogs, and showed zero remorse. The worst part was realizing there was little we could do about it. In my anger, I considered calling a tow truck, but quickly remembered that's not how things work here in the UK. It's a long, complicated process to get illegally parked cars removed from private property. The police can't even help in situations like this. As I drove home, my mind raced with thoughts of revenge. But then I looked over at my corgi, happily snoozing after her big day of scent work, and I realized something. Those entitled football players might have ruined our afternoon, but they couldn't take away the joy my dog and I had experienced during the workshop. I decided to channel my frustration into something positive. The next day, I called the community center and spoke with the manager. I explained the situation and suggested they install removable bullards at the entrance to the car park. This way, legitimate users of the center could access it, but entitled parkers would be kept out. To my surprise, the manager was receptive to the idea. He'd been looking for a solution to this ongoing problem and thought this might work. He thanked me for the suggestion and promised to bring it up at the next board meeting. Those football players might never learn their lesson, but at least I'd taken steps to prevent future dog owners from experiencing the same frustration. Five years ago, I met him at a local coffee shop. He was charming, funny, and seemed like a genuinely nice guy. We hit it off immediately and before I knew it, we were dating. At the time, I was doing pretty well for myself. I had a good job, owned my own home, and had a couple of nice cars. He, on the other hand, was struggling. He had a beat-up old car that barely ran and lived in a tiny apartment with furniture that looked like it belonged in a college dorm. I didn't care about any of that, though. I was in love, and I wanted to help him. So, I started paying for everything. Our dates, groceries, even his rent when he was short. I thought I was being supportive, you know, building a life together. We got married after a year of dating and that's when things really started to change. He quit his job saying he wanted to find his passion. I supported him thinking it would be temporary. But weeks turned into months and months into years. All the while, I was working overtime to keep us afloat. We bought a house together. Well, I bought it, but his name was on the deed. I furnished it with my own money, bought new appliances, even got him a new car. And what did he do? He sat around playing video games and networking online. One day, I came home from a 12-hour shift to find him lounging on the couch, surrounded by takeout containers. 
I asked him if he had applied for any jobs that day. He casually replied that he hadn't, claiming he was busy and questioning why he needed to since we were doing fine. I told him we weren't doing fine and that I was exhausted from working so much. He dismissed my concerns, telling me not to be dramatic and insisting that I loved my job. That was the moment I realized I couldn't do it anymore. I had become nothing more than a walking ATM to him. So, I filed for divorce. During the divorce proceedings, I surprised everyone by being incredibly generous. I let him keep the house and all the furniture. My lawyer thought I was crazy, but I just wanted out. I told my lawyer that I didn't need the house or the furniture and that I just wanted to start over. The lawyer questioned if I was sure reminding me that I had paid for everything. I assured the lawyer that I was certain and just wanted it to be over. But as I was packing up my things, all the resentment I had bottled up for years came bubbling to the surface. That's when I got the idea. I went to the store and bought the biggest Sharpie marker I could find. Then I went through the house writing property of my full name on the back or underside of every single item I had bought. The couch, the TV, the fancy coffee maker, he loved so much. Everything. For the smaller items, I cut out little strips of paper, wrote my name on them, and taped them in hidden spots. I even used some cheap masking tape for things like lamps and coat racks. As I was doing it, I could almost hear his voice in my head, asking what I was doing and calling it childish. In response to this imagined criticism, I muttered to myself, questioning if mooching off your wife for five years wasn't equally childish. I know it's petty. I know it's not going to change anything. But there's a part of me that feels incredibly satisfied knowing that every time he uses something in that house, my name will be there, reminding him of everything I did for him. The day I left, he actually had the nerve to thank me for my generosity. He expressed gratitude for letting him keep all the stuff, acknowledging that I didn't have to do that. I tersely agreed that I didn't have to and told him to enjoy it. Maybe he'll find my little gifts right away. Or maybe it'll take years. Either way, I hope it makes him think twice before taking advantage of someone else. I'm not proud of what I did, but I don't regret it either. Sometimes you just need to leave your mark, even if it's in permanent marker on the bottom of a coffee table. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching, and see you next time.